Let's examine some popular arguments for 0.9 recurring equals 1. Speaking on behalf of disbelievers, real numbers are not intuitive. They rely on the concept of infinity. And any argument against real numbers will simply be declared to be invalid. So now let's examine some other arguments for 0.9 recurring equals 1. Three common arguments are that 1 third equals 0.3 recurring, so it follows that 1 equals 0.9 recurring. If we subtract 0.9 recurring from 1, we get 0. And finally, there's the algebraic proof that 0.9 recurring equals 1. We'll examine each of these arguments in turn. First up, 1 divided by 3. We are indoctrinated at an early age into believing that a division process such as 1 divided by 3 can yield an infinite result. And given that a whole cake can be divided into three parts, then 3 times this infinite answer, which is 0.9 recurring, must equal a whole one. But does the division process really produce an infinite result? After getting the first three, there's a remainder of one-tenth that still needs to be divided by three, meaning there's a remainder of one-thirtieth. After getting the second three, there's a remainder of one-three-hundredth. After the third three, a remainder of one-three-thousandth, and so on. And in general, after producing n decimal places, there is a remainder of 1 over 3 times 10 to the power n. So there will always be a non-zero remainder. The remainder can't go away. But as young children, we are duped into believing that an actual infinity of decimal places is theoretically possible, and that this supposedly makes the remainder disappear. This disappearing act can supposedly be demonstrated on the number line. After n decimal places, the distance to one third is 1 over 3 times 10 to the power n. Then if we assume an actual infinity of digits is possible, then no points can exist on the number line between 0 0.3 recurring and one third. If there are no points between them, they must be the same value. But we can flip the argument around and say there is a positive distance between one third and any given number of decimal places, and this holds for all infinitely many of the decimal places. This would appear to show that either 0.3 recurring cannot exist, or if it does, then it can't equal a constant value. This is the same game of cat and mouse that we saw in the intuitive argument for 0.9 recurring equals 1. We have two equal and opposite arguments, one favouring equality and one favouring inequality. Surely, if you're going to be consistent in your scheme of logic, then you can't completely disregard one of two equal and opposite arguments, just because it doesn't get you to the answer that you want to get to. But it appears mathematicians can decide what logic to accept and what to reject. This begs the question, how can there be any value in mathematical proof when you're allowed to make up all the axioms and make up the rules of logic in order to prove anything you want to? And the reason they wanted this particular result was to support their notion of real numbers through this theory of convergence. They got away with this approach by allowing one side of the argument to be written down using mathematical notation, and by not letting the other side of the argument be written down in a formal fashion. They could then claim it was an invalid argument. Next we have the argument that, if we subtract 0.9 recurring from 1, we get 0. Hence, 0.9 recurring must equal 1. But if 0.9 recurring is not a fixed value, and instead it's a sequence, then in order to subtract it from 1, we need to treat 1 as a sequence, and to do arithmetic on sequences or series. The number 1 can be converted to the series 1 plus endless zeros. Then, if we subtract the series for 0.9 recurring, we get a new series as the answer. Or we could treat 1 as a sequence. Subtract the sequence for 0.9 recurring. 
and get a new sequence as the answer. Perhaps the best approach is to work with the nth sum expressions. And when we do the subtraction, we get a result of 0 plus 1 over 10 to the power n. Unlike 1 and 0.9 recurring, this result can't be mapped to base 10 place values. This result might describe a sequence of journeys in the real world. The first value in the sequence is 0.1, and so the first journey could be to a position at one tenth of a certain distance. The next value is 0.01, and so the next journey could be to the position corresponding to one hundredth of the total distance. And so on. You'll never get to zero by following this sequence, and so the result is clearly not zero. Similarly, we could ask, what is halfway between 0.9 recurring and 1? Again, 0.9 recurring is not a single number, it is a sequence of numbers. And so we need to work with sequences or series, or nth sum expressions. Then halfway between them will be a series where the nth sum is 1 minus a half of 1 over 10 to the power n, which is the sequence 0.95, 0.995, 0.995, and so on, which can also be expressed as a series. But just like the result of 1 minus 0.9 recurring, this result can't be mapped to base 10 place values. Obviously, mathematicians will completely reject all our arguments because we are not working with their so-called real numbers. It's like they've defined that the creation of man must be as described in their holy scriptures and we are not allowed to believe in evolution because they say we must accept their religious doctrines. Finally, we have the well-known algebraic proof that goes like this. Let x equal 0.9 recurring. So 10x is 9.9 .9 recurring. Then we subtract the first line from the second, giving 9x equals the number 9. And so x must equal 1. Now, let's redo this proof but with 0.9 recurring as a series. We write the same line down again and note the one-to-one -one correspondence between the terms of the sequence. Then we multiply the top line by 10. Note that each term of the series gets multiplied by 10 and we keep the one-to-one -one correspondence with the original terms. Now we do the subtraction and the resulting series on the right-hand side is 81 over 10 plus 81 over 100 and so on. It is not the number 9. If we wanted to get 9 as in the original proof, we would have to shift the terms breaking the one-to-one -one correspondence, and we would have to believe that we can match all of the original terms with all the original terms less one of them. But can we really do this? We could test if this logic is correct if we could find a case where the trailing part cancels out in both scenarios when we shift the terms and when we don't shift the terms. And this series fits the bill. On the left hand side we won't shift the terms and on the right hand side we will. We'll shift by one place as in the proof. We do the subtractions and we end up with 0 equals 1 which is a clear contradiction. So this tells us that we can't match the original terms with one less than the original terms. And so the original proof is flawed and it doesn't prove that 0.9 recurring equals 1. Yet again the mathematicians will claim we're not following their rules. But we used the series 1 plus 1 plus 1 etc. to test the logic of matching all the original terms with one less than all the original terms in a subtraction. The only thing that's relevant to the cancelling out is that the series is endless. But the mathematicians will claim that we can't test the logic with a divergent series. And we still can't understand why. All of these series are simple geometric series, so in that sense they all have the same structure. They just have different first terms and common ratios. And so we stand by our argument that the shift and subtract logic is completely invalid. In fact, it could be argued that every converging series contains diverging series hidden within them. If we allow regrouping of terms, then even a converging series like 0.3 recurring 
can easily be converted into three series, such as 1 plus 1 plus 1 and so on, minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 and so on, and the original series itself. Then we can line up the terms at different offsets, making the whole thing tend towards different values, such as 1 and 1 third, or 2 and 1 third, and so on. If sequences and series have real-world meanings, then this would come as no surprise, because obviously the rearrangement of terms will change the meaning of a series or sequence. The mathematicians will say that 3 tenths plus 3 hundredths and so on is an absolutely convergent series. And we would only be able to make it converge to different values if it was conditionally convergent. Because then the Riemann rearrangement theorem would apply. They're effectively saying that it's fine to rearrange terms as long as it can't be viewed as changing the series from one of their categorizations to another one of their categorizations. In fact, rearrangement can even make a series diverge. So surely we can't claim that different series are fundamentally different kinds of objects just by placing them into different classifications, especially when it's so easy to drift across these made-up classifications by simply rearranging the terms. But we are not allowed to question the mathematician's rules. And anyway, these written symbols only represent real numbers, and real numbers themselves are the true fundamental objects, not their written representations. So 1 and 0.9 recurring just happen to represent the same real number. Fundamentally, a real number is an equivalence class of Cauchy sequences of rational numbers. Which means it's some weird abstract structure that's an infinite set containing infinitely many sequences, each of which contains infinitely many terms. What could be easier to understand or to conceive of in the mind than that? So who wins the battle over the common arguments? Does physical reality-based logic win the day? Does it make sense to say the division process can't do an actual infinity of stages? Is it fair to reject a logical argument by not allowing it to be written down? Should we be forced to accept the rules of real analysis? Do the convoluted classifications and rules concerning the rearrangement of terms sound like they were contrived just to allow mathematicians to reject any arguments against real numbers? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we think, because the mathematicians decide and dictate the rules. And sadly, people generally like to believe in non-physical things, and that they can conceive of the infinite. And so the supporters of real numbers will again be seen as the winners.